Hello friends, welcome back uh, to the JBoss series. In the first two videos, we have discussed about uh, the difference between JBoss EAP and then JBoss AP and Wildfly. And in second video, we had discussed about uh, the basic components of JBoss, uh, like domain controller, process controllers, and then host controller, okay, server groups. So in third part, we will discuss about the basic architecture of uh, the JBoss, how the requests get handled when we configure the JBoss in the production environments. Okay, and after this, for the next few sessions, we are going to discuss about the uh, JBoss installation, deployment, data source configurations, and all. So let us begin with the architecture. Okay, so first, before that, before we go to understand the architecture of JBoss, uh, let us understand the request flow. Suppose there is a user, okay, try to access some website, okay, and this website uh, could be in the internal network or maybe in the outside the internet or in the public domain, okay, and then your website could be on the web server, okay? And then your web server, which also called a web server or web or servlet container because it, it handled the uh, the HTML and few uh, JSP and ASP kind of a request, right? And maybe your web server need a connection with a database to, to uh, fetch some data, okay? With the help of your JSPs and ASPs, okay? And in that case, you means you do not have any business logic. You don't have any business logic that need to be executed. You have only few HTML contents, few images, videos, text files. And apart from that, you have a JSPs and ASPs, which may need to generate certain kind of a dynamic request at the runtime to by fetching some data from the database. Okay. But apart from that, if suppose that you, if you have a business logic that need to be executed, which, need, which is developed in your advanced Java or EJPs, enterprise Java means, okay, for that you need an application server, right? Because that will be executed by your application server, which has a EJB container, right? And apart from that, it has the web server container as well, because an application server can act as a web server as well as your application server, okay? So that means when you have some static contents or, or maybe GSPs and ASPs, for that you need a servlet container, which is there in your web server, okay? And, but if you wanted to execute your business logic, okay, which is developed in your advanced Java, as I said in EJBs, for that you need an application server for the execution of your business logic, and then your application can connect with the backend database. So this is the very basic flow when we talk about a user uh, accessing an application and how it is getting handled in the backend, okay? Now, same thing. So these are the certain examples of your web server, application server, and database. We have a Apache web server, or a HTTP server, IBM HTTP server, and Jinx, and then a lot of different web servers are there in the market. Apart from that, we have a different WebLogic server, okay? And, but when we talk about the top three, it is WebLogic server from Oracle, IBM WebSphere, and Red Hat JBoss which is the uh, proprietary version of, you can say, of the open source JBoss server. And then there's a backend database, which could be your Oracle, MySQL, MSQL, PostgreSQL, or MariaDB, and many more are there. Now, again, it's send the same architecture in the high availability mode, okay? High availability mode in, in the sense that we have a multiple instances of your web servers, multiple instances of your applications are running to provide you the high availability. So that in that one of the server get crashed, you should have availability of application from the other web server or maybe from the other application server, okay? And apart from that, there are three terms that is called scalability, load balancing, and failure. So scalability in the sense that how you are going to scale your architecture in the future. For example, today we have a load of 100 users for that I have uh, defined my architecture with two web servers and two application servers, and tomorrow your user load is going to be increased from 100 to 150 or maybe to 200, then you need to increase your capacity of your architecture as well. Right, so that means instead of two web server, you have to scale your environment with the three or four web servers. And similarly, uh, for the backend, you need to scale your application server from three to four or maybe four to five. Okay, and similarly, you need to increase the capacity of your backend database as well because your load are getting increased. So that is called scalability. Load balancing in the sense when you're getting a multiple request and, and you have a high availability architecture where your multiple instances of web servers and application servers are running in the backend, then you need to make sure that the load is proper on all the running instances. It's not like that uh, out of 170 requests are going on server one and only 30 requests are going on server two. Okay. If you have a two servers and 100 requests are coming, then we need the distribution like 50 and 50. And that is called load balancing. Failover in the sense, if you have a two application servers, when it gets crashed, then all that session data, which is connected to that particular server, get failover to the running server along with the session data. That is called failover. So these are the capabilities we configure when we go for the highly available 
environment configuration okay so now to understand in that way let's suppose that a user trying to access a website which is deployed in maybe in the private network or in the public network which can be accessible from the public network that means on the internet or maybe from the intranet okay and there is another term in between that is called a load balancer which is basically most of the time you can say it is a hardware load balancer it comes with the certain features okay but most of the in the organization in the production environment you will see a hardware load balancer is there in front of your web servers okay so the work of load balancer is to divert the request to the different web servers apart from that it has some more capabilities as well okay and uh, so for example in the backend i have three web servers okay so my load balancer will divert the request or load balance the request between all three web servers so in my available high availability architecture i have three web servers okay so if, suppose that request one will come it will go to web server node one second request will go to node two and the third will go to node three corresponding to that i have three application servers in the backend node one node two and node three okay you can say three instances of your jboss instance okay now the request from each and every web server can go to any application server that means node one can send to request to any of your jboss instances either one two or three similarly node two and node three also can send request to any of the backend server either node one node two node three of your jboss server okay that means you have a three uh, servers within the jboss server group and again in the backend you again you have a cluster or a uh, multiple instances of database are running for high availability when we talk about oracle there would be a rack cluster real application cluster for the high availability okay so that means three instances of your oracle instances are running in the back end and similar like your web server are sending requests to any of your existing application server node in the same way your any of your application server can request to any of the database instance node for the high availability and load balancing okay and for failover as well like this so this is the highly available architecture okay so when i was talking about there would there could be a hardware load balancer in front of your web server which is there in production environment in most of for most of the clients so apart from the benefit of load balancing the request between web servers some more benefits like ssl termination okay ssl termination in the sense we know that as of today all the websites are getting secured with the help of ssl certificates where we have to apply uh, for the certificates and when we get the certificate from the authorities we apply or configure our web server or our application servers okay but in a production environment where we are using the hardware load balancer in front of our web servers okay that means our some of the content our deployed on the web server and the business logic deployed in my application server or there could be possibility that the everything is deployed in your application server and web server is acting just as a request forwarder to the backend application server okay in all cases you can configure the ssl at the load balancer level okay if you are configuring your ssl at the load balancer level then in most in the situations most scenarios it is not need to be configured in the web server level or the application server level okay sometimes it is required that your application need a end to end ssl flow okay but it is very rare most of the time in the many production environment you will see that ssl is configured only at the hardware load balancer level there is no ssl in the web server or application server level few more benefits we can say uh, the ssl termination right we are configuring the ssl at the load balancer then it is not required in the web or application server level second benefit is the session stickiness okay which is also called as session persistence that means whenever a user is connected with the your application server okay for example we have three application server whenever a user will request the your website okay it will get connected to either one of the application backend application server either node 1 node 2 or node 3 okay and till the server till that user is connected to that backend server all the requests if we, if we have session stickiness is enabled then all the requests will handle get will be executed by the backend server only that means suppose the user is connected with the help of node one of application server then till that user is connected with the application server or maybe with the website or whatever the things that he or she is doing it will be executed by the node one only otherwise what will happen is that if the session stickiness is disabled disabled then request one will have uh, when the user is connected to node 1 it will get executed by node 1 and whenever the work, the user is doing lot of work in the website every time the new request will come after the some time okay it will get connected to any of the node okay and sometimes it is important that whenever a user is connected to the backend application server the data of the user need to be persistent okay till he or she connected with the backend application server and this is useful in that case okay and this is called session stickiness which can be configured at your load balancer level okay apart from that few more benefits are there but these are the two important benefits apart from the load balancing of the request to your backend web servers now let us see the request flow in terms of the apache web server and jboss two node cluster 
Okay. Suppose again that is a user try to access a website from the internet or intranet network. The request will go to the load balancer. From load balancer, suppose that I have two web server in the backend, Apache web server in the backend, web node one and web node two, right? And specifically in terms of JBoss, I have a two machines or you can say two hosts or two servers in the backend, node one and node two, right? And now, as we have discussed in the session one, we have a host controller in each and every host, right? Whoever is running your uh, servers, where we deploy the application. So in node one, we have a host controller one and in node two, we have a host controller two. Okay, now when we talk about the node one and node two, there would be a process controller. Okay, apart from the uh, host controller, you will have uh, another process which will be running on the separate JVM. That means there would be a separate JVM process for your host controller, there would be a separate JVM process for your uh, process controller. Okay, which will be running on a separate JVM. But the, what is the use of process controller is that it take it, you can say it is a supporting supporting process for your host controller. Okay, so because your host controller uh, manage your server groups where we deploy the applications, right? So pro pro process controller helps our host controller for all of the activities that he that host controller does with the uh, server groups, okay? And apart from that, if your host controller get crash, this process controller will automatically start your host controller, okay? So this is a helper <clears throat> process for your host controller. So apart from that, we have a third machine as well, which we defined as a domain controller. And this domain controller is going to control your node one and node two. So node three is a domain controller, which is a centralized machine okay which will be going to use as a controller for your node 1 and node 2 that means whatever the deployments we are doing on the node 1 and node 2 whatever the configurations that we are doing on node 1 and node 2 we are doing from a central uh, uh, console or a central uh, central server okay this is similar to your admin console if you have a knowledge of weblogic server then it is similar to the admin console in your weblogic server okay that means we have a machine we have where we have only admin server is running okay and it is controlling your node 1 and node so here in JBoss, we call it as a domain controller. So we have three machines. The machine node three is a domain controller, which is going to control node one and node two, where we have to deploy our, our applications. So, okay. so we are going to deploy our applications on node one and node two. So that means in that case, we have a server group, which is with the name server group one, right? So because we deploy the application in a server group, just like a cluster in WebLogic server. And this server group is created with the help of HA profile, which is a high availability profile, okay? And Inside that, we have two servers. Server one is on node one and server two on node two. Okay, that means we have a two instance of JBoss. Server one is running on node one, server two is running on node two, and both inside the server group one. Okay, and where we have deployed the application. So your web server can send requests to any of the node, either node one and node two. Similar to your web server two can send requests to any of your node, either node one and node two. And again, for the high availability, you have a uh, rack cluster in the backend in case of Oracle. Right, and your server group can send a request to any of your database instance, either to database one or database two, right? And when we talk about the Apache, because your Apache web server is forwarding request to your uh, uh, your JBoss instance, right? So to configure your JBoss with your Apache web server, there are certain connectors that come with the Apache web server. These are the mod underscore cluster, mod underscore JK, mod underscore proxy. IS API connector and NS API connector. And these connector you can use based on your web server. Okay, whether you are using the Apache web server, whether you are using the Microsoft IIS. Okay, so based on that, you can configure your uh, 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 web server. Okay, so this is the high availability flow uh, in case of you are using a JBoss. Uh, cluster with two servers. Okay, now let us talk about the different uh, scenario where we have a public and private load balancer. So what is the mean of public and private load balancer is, suppose that a user trying to access a website from the internet, that means from the public domain, that means you have a website which is accessible from the public network. Okay, so for that you have uh, a public load balancer. Okay, and suppose that same time with some other user you have, okay, some, you have some more users, okay, those are going to website, okay, from the private or from the internal network, right? So for that, you will have a private load balancer. So when you will uh, configure your load balancers, then you will configure two load balancers. One is for public request and second is for private network. So public network will be get exposed from the public internet, but private network will not get exposed to the outer network and it will be restricted to your internal network only because you have a lot of applications that is only applicable for the internal employees, right? And so then some applications are for the external customer, external world as well, right? So in that case, you will have a 
public load balancer and the second you have private load balancer okay and then in the back end you will have a suppose you have a two web server node apache web server node one and node two which will be inside dmz zone so when we place the web server in a dmz zone that is called a demilitarized zone okay this is a secure zone that will be only where we deploy only the web servers for the security purpose okay so we will not going to deploy any other applications inside our dmz or demilitarized zone there will be only web servers would be there your public load when we talk about the public load balancer it will this public load balancer will send a request to your web servers which is there in dmz in the back end you have a two node of jboss right and then you have a third node which is a domain controller which is controlling your node 1 and node 2 we have a server group where we have a server 1 on node 1 and server 2 on node 2 and then your web server can send request to any of the node in the back end okay because this is a public network where the requests are coming from the public right so there could be a firewall after your dmz and between your application server okay and it is also possible that we have a firewall between your load balancer and then the web server, web server as well okay and the back end you have a database high for high availability you will have a cluster where you have multiple instances of database are running and your server can connect to any of your backend database. So this would be my private zone, right? Because my application server, my database is running my private zone. And apart from that, my application is getting access from the internet with from the DMZ demilitarized zone where we I have only web servers are get placed. Those are sending the request to the backend application server. Now, when we talk about the request flow or the internal network, that means the application that are getting from the inside network. For that, I really don't need the DMZ because that is for only for the internal. So that means I can have a different web server uh, for that one, right? That is specifically for my internal traffic. And then I can divert my traffic from private load balancer to my internal web server. And from internal web server, it can go to my, my application server. Or if you don't need the web server as well, then also you can divert the request from your private load balancer directly to your application server because that is inside my private network, right? This is my private network internet. So I really don't need the Apache or any web server as well in between, okay? So this is the high availability mode architecture when we talk about the private and public uh, load balancer. But thanks for watching this video and stay tuned for a few more interesting videos.